Welcome to the DTB Podcast presented by Bless Your Heart Nonprofit Corporation. I'm Jere Jean Bonjaro, Director of Bless Your Heart Nonprofit and filling in for our regular host, Brennan Mathern, as we speak to the most interesting people up and down Bayou Lafourche. Since the beginning of the DTB Podcast, we have searched for interesting and inspiring people who live here or are from Bayou Lafourche. In Season 1, Episode 12, we were inspired by Lauren Laparus Guidry, a local Thibodeau woman who suffered with cystic fibrosis and received a double lung transplant. In that episode, Lauren explained the impact of her double lung transplant and how it ultimately led to her and her husband Seth adopting their son Sutton. Having received the insight and inspiration from an organ transplant recipient from our area, our team thought it would be important to hear from a local donor. Today, we're meeting with J.C. LaBeouf, a local woman who signed on as a potential donor with Be The Match, a nationwide nonprofit which matches individuals in need of bone marrow transplants with willing donors. So, J.C., welcome to the DTB podcast. Hey. Uh, So, J.C., I'm going to ask you uh, just regular uh, down the body question. Introduce yourself. Tell uh, tell us who your parents are. Where'd you grow up? Who's your mama and papa? All right. So uh, my parents are Casey and Jason LaBeouf. Um, my grandparents are David LaBeouf um, and Annette Fournier's now. Um, David LaBeouf was the owner of like all the different Frank supermarkets and everything. Um, And then my other grandparents are Karen Guidry and John L. Guidry. A lot of people might know John L. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And I grew up in Cutoff. I went to South Lafouche um, and I loved getting to grow up down the bayou. It's such a special place. Absolutely. So we actually interviewed uh, Mr. David about Frank's. I want to say in season two. Yeah. So you'll have to listen to that episode. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So tell us uh, like about your education. You said you graduated from South LaFouche High School, but like, where are you now? What are you doing? Um, So I graduated in December from Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. Um, I graduated in kinesiology and, um, Since then, I was working full time as a medical assistant until about a couple weeks ago. Um, And I'm currently living in Lafayette for the summer um, with my boyfriend um, so we can spend some time together before I move out to Alabama in a couple months. Um, And I'm just waiting to start uh, PA school to get my master's now. (laughs) So that's awesome. How long is that program? Um, My program is going to be 27 months. Awesome. Yeah. Graduate school is not for the week, but I'm sure that you (laughs) you can handle it. I'm excited for it. That's awesome. I'm excited for you. Um, So tell us about Be The Match. Like, how did you find out about it? How did you get started with it? Give us the details. Yeah. So I was on campus one day. Um, going to class and I just saw a little table set up with a be the match flag on it. And a um, couple of students were trying to recruit people to sign up. Um, so I stopped and I kind of learned about it a little bit. And it was actually one of my friends that I had met freshman year um, who is the campus rep. So I asked her how I could get involved with that because um, I was an officer in our PA club at LSU. So I wanted to kind of join the two forces together. Um, And then once I started working with her on it, I decided to volunteer um, and sign up. It was super easy. All I had to do was take a little swab, swab each side of my cheek, put it in an envelope, send it off. And that was it. Wow. Um, Make a little account. Um, If you are not at a place where they are having a fundraiser or anything like that. You can go on their website. They send you the kit in the mail. You do it. Then you just send it back. It's super easy. Um, And you kind of just forget about it until you get a call. If you ever do get a call. Right. Um, So tell me, like, did you, like when you first signed up, like, did you ever think that you would get a call? Not at all. Um, I think they say it's about a 7% chance that you actually get a call. 
to be the match um, for someone else. And when I got it, I was like, oh my goodness, like, <laughs> that's so crazy. And my friend was freaking out because I was like one of the first ones at LSU to ever get a call. Um, so it was super exciting, super crazy. And I'm very glad that it happened. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So tell us about that. Like, what was it like when you first got the call? Like what, it, I mean, what do they tell you? Like, we need your bone marrow. Like, how does that happen? So it's a lot of waiting, a lot more waiting than most people might assume. Um, I pretty much got a email that said that I'm a potential match with someone and they would want some further testing done. So um, I had to go to a doctor, get some blood drawn, that kind of thing. Um, And then that got sent off for more testing. It was probably another two to three months before I heard anything back after that. Um, So that was very nerve wracking time. I just wanted to know, Um, but I just had to be patient. Uh, My coordinator told me that there were about five to six other people who could also potentially be a match. So they were kind of comparing between all of us. After that, I did get another email saying that it's going to move forward. We're moving forward in the process. I had to get some more blood work done um, and a physical to make sure I was good. And then that got sent off again. And actually, I was selected as the backup donor um, for my specific case. So kind of was just waiting around, seeing my coordinator was kind of tentatively setting different dates that I would potentially be able to do. Um, And about a week and a half before, I actually got a call saying that I'm going to be the primary donor. Um, So that was awesome. And the whole foundation is just incredible. I mean, they took care of booking the flights. They took care of booking the hotel, everything. They paid for everything, gave me a food allowance per day, um, paid any off time that I had to take from work. They paid the difference in my salary. Wow! It was just a great experience. It was very, very stress-free. They took care of everything. All I had to do was pretty much scan the ticket on the barcode to go onto the airplane. And I was That was it. Um, They took care of everything else. So where'd you have to go? I went to San Antonio, Texas. um, But it's really you can go anywhere. Um, They try to pick the one closest to your region. Um, They didn't have any in Louisiana, any donor centers specific for it. But yep, I went to San Antonio for both different times that I donated. So tell, like, do they tell you very many things about your, your recipient? So I still to this day, don't know anything besides the fact that he is a 55 year old man. Um, and he has acute myeloid leukemia and that's all I know. Um, there's a one year time frame before you can like reach out. Um, I do know that he's doing well. They are allowed to tell me that, um, But yeah, besides that, that's pretty much the only information we're allowed to know about them. Wow. So even if like the donor wanted to talk to you, like he couldn't? No, there's a one year time frame. So um, coming up in August, I would have been able to contact him. Um, You can contact them anonymously until then, uh, but can't really say much about yourself. Um. But yeah, since I donated again in February, that one year mark kind of resets. So got to wait again. (laughs) Oh, man. So you definitely would want to meet him? Absolutely. I think that that would be such a blessing to be able to just see it come to fruition and see that I actually did save a life. Yeah, for that's that's just like amazing to me. Tell me like what, so when you first like get this call, like what is going through your mind? Like, did they educate you at all on like how this process was going to work? Yes. So um, my coordinator that I keep mentioning, they will assign you a coordinator. Basically, whenever you first get the initial email saying you might be a match. Um, and she was incredible. I mean, I had her phone number. I could text her any time of day, whatever I needed. And she would respond to me. Um but they did give a lot of 
like packets and everything, learning about the different kinds of transplants you can do, the process. They gave me a pamphlet on acute myeloid leukemia so I could actually learn about the disease um, my recipient has. So they are so good at educating and their website also is very informative for anyone who might be interested in signing up. Um, They have everything, all the cards laid out on the table. They want you to know um, what you're signing up for and that it's all voluntary, the entire process. I could have sat in the chair in San Antonio and decided I didn't want to do it, changed my mind um, up until whatever point it's all completely voluntary. So how, tell me about the first time you go to give, you said you went to San Antonio, the first time you go to give your bone marrow, like walk us through that. Like how long did you have to even, like you took off of school work? So yeah, um, I, the first time I ended up taking a week off just to prepare, just to make sure that I wasn't rushing back into anything. Um, so the first round was actually kind of rough for me. I had to do something called filgrastim injections. So that was to my transplant. Um, a home health nurse had to come to my house and give me two doses of this shot every day. Um, and the side effects of that were just kind of, I was really, really tired. I had muscle aches, um, things like that. Kind of felt like I had the flu. Um, but after the first couple of days, I was fine. Um, we got to San Antonio. I did the donation that was, I went in at about seven o'clock in the morning. Um, I had two nurses allocated only to me. Um, I sat in like a donor chair. It was like a little community room, but I was the only one in there. So it was kind of, it was still private. Um, they have a little TV you can set up. My mom was with me. They order you breakfast, lunch, all that kind of stuff. Um, basically they put an IV in each of your arms. Um, one is going to be filtering the blood out one filtering it in. Um, and it's called peripheral blood stem cell transplant. So they're able to take stem cells from my body and basically take it into a lab and make it compatible to where it would be like giving the new patient bone marrow. Um, super cool process, but, um, that took about six hours the first time. Um, it really wasn't bad. I just couldn't move my arms much, but I had Netflix. So I was just <laughs> relaxing, watching a movie. Um, it really wasn't anything too serious. Um, and the nurses were fabulous. Um, everyone took such great care of me and they knew, they knew about be the match. So they know that you're saving a life and they, they're very like excited about it. And yeah. they were just great. That's That's amazing. So before the interview, you and I were talking, like, I guess maybe, and maybe this is just like non-education on my part. I thought that like a bone marrow transplant required like going into your bone and like extracting something. And I guess like in just TV or the news or whatever, I thought that that was like a very painful process, but you're saying it's really not a very, I mean, other than having two IVs, it's not, I guess, as invasive as it used to be. Yeah. So, um, it used to be a pretty big recovery window also, because you had to have that surgical procedure done. You would be under anesthesia, all of that. It would be like a real surgical procedure. Um, and yet you're right. They would take a needle, put it in your hip bone, extract the bone marrow straight from the area. Um, and I guess just since medicine has been progressing so much, um, recently they, they have found that stem cells um, doing it just from the blood has been as successful as taking it directly from the source. So, um, only about 10 to 15% of people actually have to do the surgical procedure. Um, but for me, I was honestly back to normal and fine. Like the day after my transplant, my, them taking it. So it really wasn't a long recovery process at all. I mean, for the day, of course, it's not comfortable, right. but it it really wasn't anything to worry about. I was a lot more nervous than I should have been, really, for sure. <laughs> Tell, yeah. Like, so, I mean, if they would have told you, like, JC, we have to go in and do that, you know, really invasive procedure, like, had you considered that? 
So yeah, um, it was difficult. And I was very nervous about when I first got the initial call, that that would be the case. And only because I was going through um, PA school applications at the time. So I knew I would be having to do in person interviews and that kind of thing. And I was still in college. So I didn't know how much time I would actually need because some people it takes a couple weeks for them to feel back to normal just because they're sore. I mean, um, in their hips, and it's hard to walk sometimes. Some people have had great results and are fine in three days. Um, I just knew it would be a big risk. Right. So it definitely would have been something I had to think about. I do think that in the end, I probably would have done it. Um, just because it's just an opportunity you can't pass up. Like when they called me again in February, asking if I could go back to um, donate some white blood cells and things like that to kind of help his treatment start progressing faster. I mean, it was like, without a doubt in my mind, it was like, absolutely, yes. Um, and that that was a little more invasive. They just had to do it for um, the same exact process, but it was for eight hours for two days in a row. Um, I had to do where I was hooked up to the machine and they were filtering the blood. Um, but yeah, I definitely would not take it back for the world. It was such a great experience, such a blessing. And I don't know, no regrets at all on my part. That's awesome. That So did, I guess my question, like after the first time, did they tell you like if it, if it took, like, I mean, I, if it took, I don't even know if that's the terminology, but like, Did they tell you how well he was progressing or not? No, not really. They haven't um, really told me anything. Uh, And and I asked a couple times just because that's how I am. And that's how anybody, I just wanted to know as much as I could. Um, And they would pretty much just say that he's fine. um, Things like that. They wouldn't go into much detail. Um, It's actually a crazy coincidence. I sent my coordinator a message like February 2nd or something asking like for an update, how he was doing. And then literally a day after she emailed me, oh my gosh, how crazy. Because I I was about to email you saying that he needs a supplemental um, donation from you. And I was like, what? <laughs> that is crazy. Wow. Just a big coincidence. So what is the time frame between you giving the donation and him receiving it? Do you know? So that I actually don't know. Um, it varies for every patient, but um, I do know that it, they were very quick to get my donation out for, for him to receive it. Um, so he wasn't He wasn't receiving the transplant in San Antonio necessarily. I don't, I don't don't know. I don't even know if he lives in the United States or overseas. Um, It could be anywhere in the world. So I just know that I had about 10 minutes. I took a little picture with my bag and they were off onto the airplane to get it um, to where it needed to be for the actual transplant. So Um, I do know that it takes a couple of days in the lab for sure to do like extra testing and things like that um, and making sure that it's suitable for the recipient. Um, So it's not immediate. Right. But yeah, um, we also had to sign a paper saying they could freeze it if they needed to, different things like that, um, because the patient's recovery can change on a dime. Um, Right. So you just don't know. (laughs) So JC, can you, if if you become a donor, can you just donate to people who like live in the United States or is this like an, a worldwide type program? So it is worldwide. It's focused in the nation. Um, it's still growing in other countries and continents around the world, but there are definitely some instances. I'm in a little Facebook group with all the different donors um, and they've had some that they've gotten to meet and some have been across the globe. Wow. What do you like if you could talk to your recipient? Like, what would you tell him? I don't even know. Um, (laughs) I would just tell him so much to say. So glad. Yeah, I'm just I would just tell him I'm so glad he's okay. Um, I'm thankful for the opportunity um, and to just live his life the best he can. And that's about it. (laughs) I don't know what else I would say. So much that has been building up when that one year mark hits. My letter to him will probably be like (laughs) 20 pages long. (laughs) 
Has anyone in your family like been a donor, like a, a organ donor or like in the Be The Match program? Or is this just something kind of on a whim that you? Yeah, just on a whim. Um, I just saw it on campus and I was like, oh, that's cool. I knew I was interested in the medical field. Um, so it was kind of just a no brainer to me. I was like, of course. Yeah. Why wouldn't I sign yeah. up? Um and just knowing your family and what kind of people they are, I'll be honest, it's not very surprising to me that you would be so willing to do something like this for somebody else because, um... <laughs> wait, my brother has a, a joke, I guess. <laughs> does does the recipient receiving down the Bayou stem cells make him a registered Kunas? <laughs> <laughs> it should. It That's should. For sure. it's yeah. Blood. He has an automatic pass from here on out. <laughs> I don't think you can filter that part out in the yeah. machine. He's going to start like <laughs> craving like really spicy food. And yeah, I understand completely. <laughs> um, JC, like since you've become a donor, have you like spoken on behalf of their organization or? Um, like um, yes. Yeah. So I actually was able to. Um, talked to a couple months ago, I went speak to the PA club at LSU um, since I had graduated. Um, and I, I went speak to all of the newcomers, letting them know what the uh, club was and the organization and kind of just encouraging them that my process was a lot simpler than a lot of people might think. Um, it's super daunting when you kind of first dive into it. A lot of people on campus would be like, oh no, and just keep walking whenever we, we were um doing fundraisers and things like that and getting people to sign up. But yeah, I've, I kept going to different outings with the club um, to get more people to sign up after. Um, and I definitely love speaking about it in any chance I get. Yeah, absolutely. I would like, you know how people brag about like running marathons? I would be like, I gave my bone marrow to somebody who needed it <laughs> twice, two times. Oh, yeah. In yeah. my PA school interviews, you better believe that that's how it came <laughs> up. <laughs> By the way, did you see my Be The Match sticker on my car? Yeah. <laughs> Girl, you flaunt that. I think that's just amazing. You know, in a time where I feel like people are so, you know, the older generations want to look at our age people or people in their 20s and say, you know, that we're lazy or we, you know, we don't have a good work ethic. Well, I feel like maybe the noise of the majority sometimes is what it is. But there, I mean, there's so many of us, I mean, so many people like you who, you know, were, were, are not self-centered. They're not, you know, they want to help other people. They want to go out of their way. Like you didn't have to go to San Antonio two times, but you chose to do that, you know, just like on your own, which I think is admirable. And like young girls should be looking up to people like you and not, you know, some of these people that we see in the media or in our communities who get, you know, maybe so much attention, we should be, you know, showing you're a great example of a, you know, a good young local woman who's doing big things. I love that about you, girl. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> when your mom posted your I story, I, I, was, I said, <laughs> we have to have her on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. A lot of, a lot of people that I've talked to are just like, I don't understand. Like, that's like a huge deal. And to me, like my perception of it is like, like, obviously I would do it. Like it wasn't even ever a question in my mind. I was like, of course, right. if there's that, that opportunity, then yeah, I'm going to take it. Right. And I guess, you know, you never know that the opportunity is even there if you don't do the swab, right? Right. So tell us like how, if I want to know if I want to get a swab sent to my house, like how do I how do I do that? So you literally just go to the Be the Match um, website. You can search it on Google, um, and it's pr probably the first one that pops up. There's a little tab that, that um, asks how you can help, um, and then you kind of just fill out a little form, make a little uh, account with your email, things like that. Um, you put any medications you take or any past medical history. Um, just the simple stuff. Right. And then you're pretty much in. They send you a little swab in the mail. It takes about 10 seconds. You just swab each cheek, put it back in this little um, envelope that they have. You just kind of stick it on there, fold it up, ship it back out. That easy. Anything else you usually talk about in terms of this process or you think you kind of hit all the high points? 
Um, I think I hit most of the high points. Um, biggest thing is just a lot of people see it and think, oh my gosh, saving a life, that's probably a lot. Or see a donor and think that it has to be an organ donor. But simple things just like having a couple needles in each arm for half a day can literally save someone's life. Right. Um, and a lot of people, like you said, just don't know about it, um, right. which is why I love speaking about it any chance I get. A lot of probably 90 percent of people are like, oh, I never heard of that. Um, and I always explain it to them thoroughly because I'm like, it's so easy and you can change your mind at any point. Right. If anything ever happens in your life. Um you know, they work with you and things like that. So this was the question I wanted to ask. Do you know if there's like anything about like medically wise, like if I have something, I can't be a match? It's very, um, I'm pretty sure it's very open to anything. Any medications is all fine as long as it's monitored. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can always stop it a certain time before donation, um, if needed, but everything that I looked at was a lot of just like infectious diseases and things like that, that, um, that stay in your blood, like HIV and things like that, that kind of puts a little red flag on the process, but I'm pretty sure everything still goes through as normal. Um, you just be very open and honest with them right. and they definitely make adjustments if needed, but it didn't seem like it was super specific on things like that. What was your family's thoughts about this whole process? Like, did you receive any like pushback at all? No, <laughs> <laughs> mostly because I think that if they would have pushed back, they knew that I was doing it anyway. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of course, my mom was scared. She she's a mom, um, but she came with me, held my hand through the whole process, fed me Whataburger fries. I mean, <laughs> she <laughs> she was there the whole time. Um, and they pay for that too. They pay for you to have a companion. They pay for their flight. They pay their salary if they need to. Wow. Um, they're very much in support of having a supporter there with you. Right. Whether it's family member, a friend. The second time my boyfriend actually came with me. Um, and he was my support system. Um, my mom was probably a little jealous that she didn't get to come <laughs> back again. <laughs> but of course. We texted her the whole time and sent pictures and kept her updated. Um, but no, my family for the most part was just like, oh my gosh, that's incredible. Yeah. So girl, call me next time. Like I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going, oh, yeah. I'd love to take a break from work and go we'll do a live podcast. If yeah, <laughs> listen, we can make that happen. I love that. That's so awesome. Is there anything in your background that really drew you to like the medical field? Um, I've always known that I wanted to do it. Um, I literally could not ever imagine myself in another career. Mm -hmm. I've always known that I wanted to work in the medical field. I was always good at math and science at, the, at a young age. Um, my aunt is was actually in PA school when I was about 12 years old. Um, and I was like, oh, that seems cool. And then from then I latched on to that. I never really thought about med school. I really liked the PA. Um, like I really, just really becoming... like the morals behind the PA. Right. Yeah, I really like the moral PA profession, and um, they really focus to serve underserved areas like I'm from, and yeah. things like that. Um, places that don't have as easy access to as many doctors. There are PAs that can go and um, support that area, and I really like that you can really advocate for your patient um, and really be there for them more as a friend. Um, have more time to talk with them and things like that. And being from a small town, I think, is definitely a huge part of that as well, because I love to talk to people. I love to know everything. Um, and that's just how I've always been. And this profession and being in the medical field, it was like, oh, that's a win win. Right. So do you have like a specific area of medicine that you're like more interested in? So I've always loved orthopedics. I think just growing up playing sports, that's just what I've seen. Um, recently, I've had a peak interest in going into trauma. Um, so we'll see. I'm trying to be really open-minded in PA school during clinicals to yeah. whatever. But I really think it's going to end up kind of ER, orthopedic, trauma, that kind of field. Yeah. 
yeah, I've definitely had some like friends and sorority sisters who like thought they were going to be really into one thing and then really got into something that they never thought that they would be into like, you know, dermatology or something. And like, they're really, you know, they love their job. They would, you know, this is absolutely what the Lord called them to do. And, um, yeah, I think going in with an open mind is going to be an amazing experience for you. Yeah. Cause I've always wanted to do orthopedics, but I've also only ever worked in orthopedics. So I don't really know what else is out there. Maybe, uh, end up loving something else. Who knows? I mean, right. the first time only in the ER, I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. So maybe I'll want to do everything. Who knows? Yeah, maybe so. Maybe <laughs> so. Um, so we'll go through our rapid fire questions if that's about it. Sounds good? Sounds good. Okay. So white beans, do they go on top of the jambalaya or on the side? On top. No questions asked. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you went to LSU. That's why. <laughs> if you have a final meal, what would it be and who would have cooked it? Um, It would probably be jambalaya and white beans. And my dad, Jason LaBeouf, would have cooked it. <laughs> <laughs> so the next time we have a jambalaya dinner, we're no, we know who we're calling. Um, Absolutely. What is your favorite snowball flavor? I have always been a fan of... Blue bubble gum mixed with coconut. Oh, I'm yeah. The trot. I now, do a little half and half. <laughs> where are you getting it from? Missy Lane's. Of course, hands down. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, she's open right now. Just letting you know. Oh, I need to come back down. <laughs> I know. I know. So, Jar Ru, do you sometimes use it or never use it? I don't even know what it is. So, no. Oh. <laughs> Homemade only. <laughs> Homemade only. So you've never seen Jaru? I've seen it like in the store, right. but no, I actually had to sit down with my dad the other day and watched him cook gumbo. It was like I was at a lecture. I wrote notes. I took notes. I watched everything. So I'm ready to make my own now. <laughs> it's funny how that's like a defining moment in your mind. Like when you first sat down to like learn, I remember my grandma, she had like, I left work early one day and she taught me how to make her shrimp bullet. And she was like, Bab, I'm going to miss my nap because I want to show you how to do this. And it was like a pivotal moment in like adulthood where you stay like pass the rain to you. Oh, yeah. Since I'm moving to Alabama, I have to get all my Cajun recipes down. Yes, girl. We're going to have to compile you a cookbook. Um, well, JC, thank you so much for um, coming on the podcast. We just appreciate you so much. We appreciate your sacrifice that you've made for your recipient and we are very excited to introduce the Bayou to the Be The Match program. Yes, I'm so excited. And I'm so glad that I came to do this. It was super fun. Awesome. So that'll do it for this episode of the DTB podcast. We really appreciate your time, JC. You can subscribe to the DTB podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at the DTB podcast. You can also follow Bless Your Heart Nonprofit on Facebook or on Twitter at BYH Nonprofit. You can donate to Bless Your Heart on Venmo at Bless Your Heart Nonprofit and on PayPal at Bless Your Heart Nonprofit at gmail.com. That'll wrap it up for us on the DTB podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button for our next episode. Until then, this is Jare Jean Bonjaro. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time.